We bring our offerings this morning as a token of our gratitude and a symbol of our commitment to your work here on earth. We remember that everything we have is a gift from you, and we're merely stewards of your blessings. As we give, we're reminded of the generosity of Jesus, who through, though he was rich, he became poor for our sake, that we might become rich in grace and love. Bless these gifts, Lord, and use them to further your kingdom. May they bring hope to the hopeless, comfort to the hurting, and light to those in darkness. Help us to be faithful stewards, using our time, talents, and treasures to serve others and glorify your name. Thank you for your unconditional love, which inspires us to give joyfully and generously. We offer these gifts in the name of Jesus Christ, who gave us everything. Amen. Amen. All right, well, a couple things before we we jump into our message today. A couple things to celebrate. Um, First off, uh, last week, if you were here, uh, we celebrated Baptism Sunday. And, and you can see on the screen, these are the baptisms that we've had over the summer. So yeah, whoever is clapping, way to lead that. Some, you, got the, you got the start of that. Good job. Um, I'm sure it was a student. Anyway, um, but we get to celebrate those. 12 baptisms, that's awesome. Um, the way that God is working, it's just the fruit of that. And I think one of the coolest parts about looking at these pictures and these baptisms is that not one of them was done by a staff member, like a paid pastor or staff member. And what that means, what that communicates, is that discipleship is taking place where believers are discipling and baptizing believers. We've got parents baptizing their children. We've got friends baptizing friends. And, and it's just such a cool thing to see um, and, and to celebrate. Also, this past week, uh, we celebrated, we had VBS here on campus, and um, uh, it was a great week here. If you were here, um, it was fun to watch and be a part of it, um, and this is the first uh, VBS that has ever been done at TCC where it was written, designed, and put together totally by the volunteers. There was no, no curriculum that was purchased or anything like that. It was all done uh, by the volunteers, and it was uh, unique uh, to our church as a whole. And one of the cool things was the VBS mission uh, fulfilled a purpose, um, and it encouraged the children, uh, but it also uh, was an opportunity. They raised funds. They raised over $1,000 uh, for Operation Christmas Child, which is the shoe boxes that will be packed and they're sent around the world. And you're going to hear more about that coming up um, in the weeks to come as we prepare uh, for the fall. We're going to have a packing party here at the church and and uh, we've been collecting items, and each, each week, if you receive the weekly text message, you see those items, and you uh, know what are being brought in and, and things like that. But some of the cool things that happened this past week, we had over 174 different children throughout the week um, here at our VBS program. Um, the biggest night was 163, all on one night. Um, and, and one of the neatest things is it took, there were 95 people that volunteered last week, and out of the 95 people, 38 of those were students, um, which is awesome. And I was working with the fourth and fifth graders. We were in this building. And uh, one of my favorite things this past week was watching uh, the high schoolers um, and the middle schoolers moving around. But as they began to get up here, there was about seven students in this building, and they led worship. Um, they led the games. They were up front. They were uh, leading the next generation behind them. And that was, that was an awesome thing for me to see and be a part of and um, Everything went really well, though, for VBS, and it was really cool to, to see all of that take place on our campus. So, um, this morning, we're going to be jumping back into our Colossians study, uh, chapter 3. You guys can go ahead and open up your Bibles. And, and we're in the middle of this chapter where Paul has been arguing that Jesus, he's before all things. That's what the whole letter has been about. And if you remember, when we started it, Paul's writing this letter. He's in prison, um, and he's, he's not the one that plants the church of Colossae. Um, he, he is writing them uh, because one of his followers, I, I think it was Epaphras, I think that's how you say his name, it's in chapter 1, um, he was one of his disciples and he had went and planted this church and so Paul's writing them a letter of encouragement and he's talking to them about Jesus being before all things and so uh, last week, or well three weeks ago when we ended, uh, we ended with verse 17 and here's the thing, like I know just like you, a lot of life has been lived um, and a lot of things has happened since we read that. So I'm going to read it again. We're going to start with verse 17, and then we're going to look at verses 18 and 19 today. So 
Paul says, he says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God our Father through him. And what we talked about three weeks ago was that gospel-infected people serve God in all areas of their life. Like, it's not just a Sunday morning thing or a Wednesday night thing. It's not just a, a small group thing. It's in all areas of their life. Their service is an act of worship. And gospel-infected people live and worship in the freedom, get this, in the freedom that they have from the gospel. So yes, they wake up in the morning and they're reminded of the gospel. Like it's all about the gospel, meaning Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, like his life living as a sacrifice. You wake up and you reflect on that and then you live in that freedom. You go and you do in that freedom and you serve one another in that freedom. See, these people are free to be who God has called them and created them to be. Their life is a proclamation of his glory. So to be clear... Paul, Paul like really wants to hammer this home for his, his readers and for us today. He's going to list out specific categories in the daily living because he wants to make sure that we understand all areas of our life. And so what he does is he says, here's what it looks like to serve Jesus and put Jesus before all things in your marriage. Okay, verse 18. Wives. Every time, uh, we're going to pause there, wives. Every time that marriage is talked about in scripture when it comes down to husbands and wives guess who it always starts with it always starts with the wives and, and, and i don't know about you but I've, i kind of wondered this a little bit this past week why like why does it always start with the wives um and and i, I don't have some deep theological answer there's not some you know greek word or hebrew word that says this is why um, I kind of chalked it up to this, that old saying we've all heard, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Happy wife, happy life. Again, it's not a deep theological response, but there's so much truth in the statement. Because wives, you will see, you set the tone in your home. Like ladies, women, your attitude will dictate the tone of your household. And this is why Paul addresses women first. And he says this, he says, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as fitting in the Lord. Now, there's a lot to be said in this little statement. Like it carries a very heavy message. And before we get to that message, I'm going to say what it does not say, okay? So understand, this is what it does not say. Never in Scripture does it ever say women submit to men. That's not found in Scripture. Nowhere in Scripture does it ever say women submit to men. It's a misinterpretation of the text. So we're going to go ahead and get that out of the way right now. Men and women are created equal inside of God. And in God's sight, we are created equal. Now, we have different roles that we serve at in different areas. Maybe it's in the home. Maybe it's in the church. Like We have some different roles that we're called to, but we are equal in the sight of God. And we see this if you go back to the beginning, the creation story. So let's recap that real quick. God said... Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And then the Lord, God formed man from the dust of the earth, of the ground, and he breathed into his nostril the breath of life. The man became a living being. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. So then the Lord God made a woman from the rib of the man that he had taken out, and he brought her to the man. This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, for she was to be taken out of men. In God's sight, man and women are equal. Throughout history, this passage has been wrongly used. In no way are women somehow lesser than men. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul addresses this very thing. He says, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. And you could fill in all the other roles that we play and have in society. You could add here relationships with parents and children, boss, employees. He says, for all of you are one in Christ. In other words, we are equal in, the nature, in our nature in Christ. Scripture does not contradict itself. Ladies, you should run your business... And do what God has called, equipped, and given you to do like a boss. You don't need a man to do it. We are equal in God's sight. However, submit to your husbands as is fitting with the Lord. Meaning, there's some ways that are not fitting with the Lord. 
Wives, this does not mean that you are to put up with abuse. Physical abuse, verbal abuse, that's not fitting with the Lord. That's not, that's not fitting. It does not mean that you put up with pornography or adultery. It, it does not mean that you are to put up with alcohol or substance abuse. This, this does not mean that you are required to put up with the things that are outside of your husband walking with the Lord. What it does mean is that you allow space for him to lead the family. If your husband is sitting beside you, he already has the burden of spiritually leading your household. And he's here, and he feels it, and it's heavy. I know that because I feel it, and I carry it, and it's scary. As a wife, the best thing that you can do is encourage and praise your husband as he leads. Cheer him on. Now, I get it. Some, 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 some of you might be sitting here going, lead my family. How do I do that as a husband, spiritually? What does that even mean? And wives are going, he doesn't know what that means. Like, understand, um, we, we get that. Sometimes it, it looks like a family devotional and walking your family through uh, the word. Sometimes it's praying every night. Okay, like we could talk about all those big things. But for some of you guys, it's just stopping and saying, hey guys, we're going to pray here at lunch before we eat. And it's taking a moment to pray. Thank God for the meal that's before you. That's an easy prayer. But it might be the first time you've prayed out loud in front of your family. And, and in that moment, it's as easy as a wife coming behind her husband and saying, awesome. I'm proud of you for that. Good job. It's easy to offer encouragement but you've got to allow time and space for the husband to lead. Like, this doesn't mean that you only follow him when you agree with him. Or like, well, I think he's making a good decision here. That's not submission. That's agreement. Something that, that, that happens, like, there's a distinction there. Sometimes wives will go, okay, well, my husband is not a spiritual leader. And they wonder, what does that mean for how I follow him? This verse does not say submit when he is sufficiently a spiritual leader in your eyes. It doesn't say that. Sometimes, if your husband is not a spiritual leader, your submission to him in leadership can help call him to that. Understand, every guy from the day that he is born is asking this one question. Do I have what it takes? Do I have what it takes to succeed in this? Do I have what it takes to achieve that? Am I doing a good job? Do I have what it takes and fill in the blank? Some of us got the affirmation from our fathers. And we, we became spiritual leaders because that's what we saw our dads do. Other of us, myself included, we didn't. And we aren't really sure that we have it to begin with and we don't know where to start. One of the biggest things that has helped me in marriage is Abigail, my wife, looking at me and saying, lead me. Lead me, lead us, lead our family. You can do this. And then she would come behind me and she would encourage me and she would, uh, she, would, she would encourage me as a leader. She would praise me in the small moments that probably didn't deserve to be praised. But, but in her praise affirmed, oh, this is, this is what I'm supposed to do. Oh, this makes sense. Like, here's the thing. Like, I didn't lead my family spiritually until three, four, five years into marriage. And that's when I kind of, it was like, oh. It might have been when I turned 26 and like everything connected up here. I don't know. But um, either way, she came behind me. And, and what it did is it affirmed in me that I could do it. It gave me some encouragement that I needed. Now, I'm not perfect. I fail at this all the time. But I know when I fail that even though Abigail might be exhausted, she's going to encourage me. As he walks with the Lord, then you are to submit with him. Verse 19, husbands, love your wives. Don't be harsh with them. Now, before we keep going... Um, I, I want you guys to over, flip over to Ephesians chapter 5. Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus. And, and, and what he's going to do here is he's including a very similar teaching in household dynamics. Okay, This text almost parallels with one another. And, and a quick Bible to, uh, study tool as you guys are, are reading scripture. Um, sometimes it's important to let scripture be commentary unto itself. Like scripture affirming itself as you're reading. As you're going to study, you're going to see passages that parallel just like this one. In Ephesians chapter 5 and Colossians chapter 3, verse 21 of Ephesians 5, he says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. 
And then Paul lays out the same three categories that, that, that come out in Colossians chapter 3. Submit in marriage. Submit in parenting. Submit in your work. And just like in Colossians, everything you do, you do it as you're unto the Lord. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It means marriage is not really about you. It's not about you. And one of the biggest problems in marriage is when a spouse tries to put themselves in the middle of marriage. When the spouse tries to make it about themselves instead of Jesus. Like Paul starts off with this submission to one another, and we are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, what does that look like? Is that like, Greg, like I'm an applications guy. Like, does that mean I need to pray three times a day over my wife? Like, what are, what are we talking about here, Greg? What does that look like? Is that morning Bible studies at 5.30 a.m. as the sun rises facing the east? Like, what, what are we talking about? Well, it's simple. You submit to your spouse out of reverence for Christ. This is more than simply treating them the way that you want to be treated. First off, we're not on the playground here, okay? We're, we're, we're husbands and wives. Treat them the way that Jesus has treated you. That's what submission looks like. That's what I'm talking about. Like this is where it starts. Submit to one another. A great marriage is built on mutual submission because that's what Christ did for each of us. Like we should submit to one another out of reverence for Jesus because he submitted to the cross for each one of us. And when you sit down and you like really think about it, it will make your brain, like I, you, I don't know how someone can sit down and truly think about the cross and the gospel and what Jesus did and not marvel at it. Like the magnitude of it. Like, like track with me for a second. And Jesus, the almighty sovereign king and creator of the universe, who is before all things and all things were created by him and for him and through him, he made our death, Bigger than his own. Like he made it a big deal. And, and, and here's what I mean. He stepped down out of heaven where, where the angels were singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. He put a pause on all of that. And he stepped down into our world. And he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he humbled himself. Humbled himself to the point of a servant obedient to death on a cross. He did all of that to endure God's wrath. He died our death, like for us, in our place. The death that which we deserved from our sin. He submitted himself to the cross. And because of that, we are to submit to one another. Like wives are supposed to submit to husbands. But husbands, you are supposed to submit to wives. And very important fact is this, that we are to submit to others in relationships like marriage. And it does not make us inferior to the person whom we are submitting to. That's a worldview. That's not a biblical view. Like understand, separate that. Submitting to our spouse does not make us inferior to the one whom we are submitting to. Look at what Paul goes on in verse 22 of Ephesians 5. He says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husband as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. And then he repeats it just to make sure it's clear. Like he basically says the same thing in a different way. He says, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to their husband in everything. But then he goes on. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church with stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands, you ought to love your wife as your own body, because he who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and, and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And this is a profound mystery, but Paul states it again. I am talking about Christ and the church. The husband submits to his wife by leading her like Christ leads the church. So what does this look like? Well, the first thing, husbands, men, we, we are to lead our 
wives and our families spiritually. Like, like, like understand, when Eve was brought to Adam, he already had a relationship with God. And, and Adam is tasked with relaying to her the commands of God. He already had a relationship with him. He already walked with the Lord. Now it's time to lead Eve and to teach Eve how to do that. Men, we are supposed to be spiritual leaders in our home. Like, like, did you see the phrase, wash her with water, with the word. Wash her with the water, with the word. That means you lead in the application of Scripture. You lead your family with the application of Scripture. How many of you are overwhelmed yet? Like you hear that, and immediately you go, wife, submit to your husbands. Man, y'all got it easy. Present, I've got to present you and our family holy and blameless. How do I do that? Like, like how, how, does, how does this work? Washing her with the word means dads, husbands, fathers, like you become the primary mouthpiece declaring to your wife and to your children God's feelings about them. Like they are valued. She is valued. They are cherished. She is cherished. They are precious. She is precious in God's sight. But you can only do this. Here's the thing. You can only be God's mouthpiece and apply the application of Scripture to your family if you are in the Word. Dads, husbands. To spiritually lead, you've got to be spiritually filled. To spiritually pour into your family, you've got to be spiritually filled from, a, from time spent in Scripture. Not riding around listening to podcasts. Like those are beneficial and they're good. Francis Chan is a phenomenal preacher. Craig Groeschel, phenomenal preacher. You can listen to them all day. But until you stop, remember we talked about it last week, uninterrupted time. Where you, where you spend moments with God in his word. Not listening to someone talk at you with his word. That's where your cup is filled. As husbands, we lead in sacrifice. In verse 31, Paul references God's instructions to the man to leave his previous life and cling to his wife. Paul is comparing, like, like get this, he's comparing this to Jesus' relationship with us. Jesus left his heavenly home where the angels were crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He put that on Paul's. He left that. And he laid down his life for us. And now we are to do the same for our wives. And laying down your life doesn't mean being willing to die for her. Again, that's, that's easy. If you truly love your spouse, like in a moment, you're not going to think. You're just going to act. It means daily putting her needs above your own. Like using, like using your power to serve her. It means that in decisions, I give her needs and preferences more weight than my own. C.S. Lewis, he said it this way, he said, men in the marriage relationship, like you wear a crown, but, but the crown you wear is first and foremost one of thorns. Humanity's fall happened through a failure, a failure of the man to lead. Like we all get real quick to talk about Eve biting into that apple, but go back to the garden, who sinned first? Adam. He was with the woman when she ate. And thus he failed in leading her spiritually. He failed in protecting her spiritually. The first sin was a sin of omission. The failure of the man to lead. And, and, and here's the thing. When, like, 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 when men in this church, when our husbands and our dads, when you resume your position of the leadership role in your family, the families in our community, the families in our church will be transformed. Studies prove this. They show that if a, if a child is the first one to get saved in the household, that about there's a 3.5% chance that other members of that household will get saved. If the mom is the first one to get saved, or if the mom is the one that's leading the charge, it, there's about a 17% chance that the rest of the household will be saved. But if the dad is saved, and if the dad follows Jesus, it's a 93% chance that the rest of the household will respond and be saved. Like men, our families will be most impacted when we 
are the ones leading the family in devotion. When we are the ones that are setting our priorities straight, when we are the ones that are leading in discipline, when we are the ones that are, that are keeping the calendar and coveting certain days of the week where we come together, but we've got to step up and do it. It takes intentionality. It takes courage. Last fall, I sent an invitation out to about 25 different guys. Tuesday mornings, we meet in that room right there from 6 to 7 a.m. And there's two reasons that I chose this time. It's not because I like getting up at 5.30 to be here at 6. I chose this time because it requires sacrifice and it requires commitment. Like waking up that early requires sacrifice, but the sacrifice also displays the commitment that we have to one another in that group. This Tuesday, we're starting a new study. If, if you're sitting here going, Greg, I'm overwhelmed. I hear what you're saying about dads, husbands, and fathers, and all these things, like, but I don't know what it looks like to lead my family spiritually. 6 a.m., we'll be in there. It's low key. There, there's nobody that's sitting in there speaking in Greek or Hebrew or that, that can levitate or any special spiritual power. Like, none of us can do that. But we sit in there and we talk about life. We sit in there and we go, man. I don't know what to do in this situation. And another guy will say, hey, I can help you. And we pray for one another. And we're honest with one another. Because here's the thing. Like I stand up here not apart from you, but with you. Because I can't lead my, like leading my family is overwhelming. It's daunting. It's scary. So that invitation is there. Tuesday morning from 6 to 7, we do it because it doesn't disrupt the work time. It doesn't disrupt family time. And it requires sacrifice and commitment to be there. So the invitation is out there. If you want to come, show up. We'll be here Tuesday morning starting a new study. Understand this, though. The goal of marriage is not to make you happy. Again, that's another worldview. It's a major misconception. Love plus marriage equals happiness. The goal of marriage is to make you holy by teaching you to love like Jesus. Marriage is a gospel reenactment. It's a sacrificial service. It's a mutual submission between two people. Marriages do not fall apart because couples fall out in and out of love. No, marriages fall apart because people fall out of fellowship with Jesus. And maybe they fall out of fellowship that maybe they never even had fellowship with Jesus. Beauty, purpose, and satisfaction in marriage come when we reflect on the true nature of the one who satisfies us completely and eternally. I love Abigail, my wife, with everything, but she cannot sustain me. Like, she cannot meet all of my needs. And it's not fair for me to expect her to do so. She cannot fill my soul. She cannot mold and change and reshape my heart. That's something that only God can do. And the same goes for her. I cannot meet or satisfy all of her needs. The soul is filled and satisfied only by the Creator. Jesus displays the purest picture of marriage by showing us that the fullness is found when He is in our life. And our lives are used to serve rather than to be served. See, through his life and death, Jesus displays the center of marriage. It's a self-sacrifice. Looking to his example, we must give our lives away to our husbands or our wives, not fight so hard to preserve ourselves. Whether you take the time to call the insurance company to set up the new policy, or, or whether you're the one that cooks dinner, or you're the one that mows the yard, or you're the one that works on the car repairs, or you're the one that runs the business, or you're the one that washes the dishes, or folds the load of laundry in, in the, uh, that's in the dryer. Like, it doesn't matter. Find ways to serve your spouse through, spouse through those things. Marriage is a gift to mankind. Several years ago, Abigail and I were talking and she said, Greg, you do realize marriage is the one relationship God never experienced. And I had never thought of it. Like, like marriage is the one gift that God gave us that he never experienced. Jesus experienced everything else. He walked alongside of us. He knew what it meant to hurt, to be sad, to fall down to feel sick, like he knew all of those things, but he never experienced 
marriage. And it exists to be the glimpse of the relationship between Christ and his bride, the church. In other words, how we act in marriage must mirror how Christ acted towards us. The aim for marriage is not for our spouse to satisfy our every longing. That's Jesus' job. Knowing that he has met all of our needs and he fulfills us completely, living with a gospel-infected heart, we live in the freedom that we can freely give ourselves away to our spouse. John Piper explains it this way. He says, marriage is meant by God to put the gospel reality on display in the world. That is why we are married. That is why all married people are married. Constant gratification will never bring lasting joy. Constant gratification will rob us of true happiness in any setting, but especially in marriage. And instead, we are supposed to sacrifice ourselves for our spouse. And when we do so, we let the true light of marriage shine. Our marriage should be less about us and more about Christ. Radical sacrifice was the centerpiece that brought great sinners a glorious redemption. And it's the centerpiece that will bring marriage the greatest joy. It will bring marriage the deepest pleasure. It will bring marriage the truest purpose. For joy, Christ gave himself in our place. Let it be for you that for your joy, that your sacrifice for your spouse, whether it's now, today, or in the future, pouring yourself out, forsaking your rights for the sake of another, and all the glory goes to Christ. This morning, as we enter into this invitation time, I know some of you are sitting here and you're going, whoa, I had never thought about marriage like that, or whoa, that's a big calling. That's a big example. Some of you dads, you husbands, you're going, I don't know how to do that. I want to extend an invitation time. I want to ask some of the elders to come up and more people to have up here to pray than what we normally have. But if you want prayer over your marriage, let us do that. And, and, and understand, this isn't prayer over your marriage like we're on the rocks and divorce is around the corner and these things are going on. No, it's not that at all. If you, have, if you have a need like that, we can pray for that. But no, no, no. This time of invitation is a chance for husbands to lead. Hey, I, I, want, I want to go up and be prayed over. I want to be a leader in my home. Let us pray over you. Because I don't know about you, but I don't have it all figured out. And I have sleepless nights where I'm going, man, am I doing my best to raise my children in God's eyes? Man, am I doing my best to lead my wife? to present her holy and blameless before the Lord? Am I doing my best there? What does that look like? Do I have the courage? Some of you just need courage. Whatever it is, this invitation time, husbands, if you want to come up, you can bring your wife with you. We'd love to pray. We would love to pray over you for a marriage that honors God, that raises children, the next generation that communicates to the world that we are free in Christ. So that's what this invitation time is. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we thank you for your words from Paul on marriage. Lord, um, to lead our families, to submit to one another, husbands submitting to wives and wives submitting to husbands, God. Lord, that's not our human nature. Our heart, we, 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 we think for ourselves, but Lord, you change our hearts. God, you took and submitted the cross, did everything totally opposite of what any cultural person would have ever thought was normal in the day. And Lord, you call us to do the same. And so I just pray right now over our marriages. I pray over our dads and our moms, God, that you give us the courage to follow you in our marriages, that you give us the courage to lead our children by example, that you give us the courage to teach the word, that you give us the courage to invite others in, and that we become a church that's centered on you. God, we thank you for your grace. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Are you hurting and broken within?